Sean Spun. Now it's time for my special guest. He's the former frontman of rock group Ugly Rumours, but you may know him better as the man who won three general elections. It's Tony Blair. <laughs> Common reaction? Uh, <laughs> not especially. <laughs> Actually, I very nearly took the wrong turning and ended up in blind date. So, I should... <laughs> well, what would you have said? Uh, what would have been the reaction? Is actually. <laughs> anyway, well done, guys. I like that. Brings back a few memories. Thank you. Well, welcome to the show. Thank um, you. Obviously, you've been back in the news recently because of the result of the referendum and your decision to to fight it. Um, perhaps in a different way to the way that the current leader of the Labour Party is choosing to fight it. Um... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Carry on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With you so far. Are there any positives at all we can take from our departure from the European Union? <laughs> um... No. I mean, look, it, it's... It, first thing to say, this is a great country. It's always going to be a great country. It'll be a great country for people to come to. Uh, you know, we'll survive outside the European Union. We can always do well as a country, but I think at this moment in the 21st century, it's a profound mistake for us. Uh, but I think there's a long way to go in this debate. I mean, I know most people say it's over, and as Theresa May was just saying, uh, as, as, as you've indicated, you know, just get on with it. But... I say it's like, you know, having agreed a house swap without having seen the other house yet. Um, so we've agreed to make the swap, but now we're going to have a chance to look at it, uh, to see the neighbourhood, to do the structural survey, to test what it's like. And once that happens, then I think the mood may, may change. So we'll, we'll see. But I, you know, I feel very sad about it in a way, because I think that in today's world in the 21st century, with the rise of China and all the rest of what is happening in the world, our place, the strong Britain, would be a strong Britain in a strong Europe, and that's what I would have preferred to have seen. So in terms of fighting it, could we ever get to a situation, do you think, in the next five years where there's a second referendum? Uh, I think it's possible you get to a position where people change their minds. Um, so people say, well, look, the will of the British people is clear, they've made their will plain, so you've just got to, to, to implement it. But, as I say, once you get into this negotiation, I think the first thing that will be clear is that it's going to be costly, it's going to be very bureaucratic, um, and we will essentially end up trying to recreate relationships we've got. I mean, remember that all through um, the history of the last 50 years, when people do trade agreements, they do it to open up trade. This is the first trade agreement that's going to be closing down our membership of the single market and the customs union. Take those things together, it's about 60% of our trade. So, frankly, we're going to find that tough, not because people are going to be hostile, but because they're going to find it tough. And I, I think it's also to do with the, the feeling about the, the, the country. I mean, it, you know, I, I get depressed when I, 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 and I don't often get depressed, but when I read sort of, you know, we're about to spend 500 million pounds switching the colour of our passport, you know, as if we needed to have a different colour of passport to prove what it means to be British. I don't need that to be sure that I'm British, but sure that I'm happy to be Britain as part of Europe. So this is... I think these are going to be big questions that the country will carry on debating, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, the referendum was, was clear, so you, you, you can't dispute the result. But I think there's a long way to go in the debate. In terms of the other implications of it, security is a, is a big one. Uh, particularly this week, I mean, obviously, as, as Prime Minister, you've been in the situation where you've had to think long and hard about committing troops. Uh, would you commit troops over Gibraltar? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't think that will ever arise. That's what we call a diplomatic answer in the trade. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, the, the, the issue in Gibraltar is not whether, whether Spain tries to take Gibraltar by force. This is ridiculous. But if it does. Uh, but it... <laughs> 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 But it won't. <laughs> uh, so, uh, no, the, the issue is very simple, of course. There is a reason, by the way, why 98% of the Gibraltarians voted to stay in the European Union. Because once you 
pull Britain out of the European Union and Gibraltar is part of Britain, then you have exactly the same border problems that you're going to have in, well, frankly, in Northern Ireland, where you're going to have major problems to try and solve that issue. And then, of course, you've got the whole issues to do with Scottish independence. In terms of your role in this now, you set up the, the Institute for Global Change. In terms of what its remit is and, and what it does, it, you know, if I'm a customer of the Institute of Global Change, and I go in and I say, you know, I really want change and I, I want it to be global. <laughs> <laughs> Have I come to the right place? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and we give you a little sticker. No, it's... Uh, um, <laughs> it's <dangerous. laughs> well, it's, it's going to be a, a little more welcoming than that. But it, 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 uh, no, it's basically, look, if you end up in a choice in British politics between a hard Brexit Conservative Party and a hard left Labour Party, uh, you know, what I want to do is to revive the centre ground in politics. And, you know, I think that, that that's got to start with a policy agenda. And I think one of the most distressing things about the whole Brexit debate is that in the meantime, the big questions, you know, what is a modern healthcare policy? What is a modern education policy? Actually, what's a modern immigration policy? You know, what do we do about technology that will displace through automation, through artificial intelligence, through big data, you know, millions of jobs? What are we going to do about those questions? Those are the questions where I think we've got to provide answers, otherwise people come along, and this is happening in Western politics, and ride the anger. So the institute that you've set up will effectively be a, a kind of, what, like a, a think tank? A, yeah, it's, a I, I want it actually to be a place where it's, it's more sort of political than that. In other words, if you're a sort of a practicing politician... Um, uh, and, Three of the band, <laughs> <laughs> You know, if you're a practicing politician and you, you, your, your basic values are those which are not based on very tribal and partisan politics and you actually want to start at least with what's the right answer, it's got to be, it's got to be political and strategic enough to say, look, here are some things that give you answers to these problems. Because all countries face the same issue. And you can see in America, you can see in France or Germany, all of politics is basically a battle between those people who actually prefer to ride the anger so they stoke up nationalist sentiment, they divide, you know, they, they find an enemy and pursue them, and those people who really want to understand the complexity of the modern world and how we answer these questions. Because, you know, it's not... This is why, again, with Europe, you know, the answer to an unemployed person in the north of England is not to stop some Polish guy coming and working as a waiter in a bar in London. It's actually to educate them properly, to make sure there are jobs for them to go to, and to give them the equipment they need to survive in the modern world. It almost sounds like a new political party. No, it's not a new political party. <laughs> I'll make that very clear. Otherwise, I have some misunderstandings. But um, no, but it is basically. I don't. I think one of the things that's really unfortunate about politics, and you can see this virtually everywhere in the Western world, is that it should be possible people, even if they come from different political traditions, to come together around certain things that are obvious and clear. You know, if you just take, for example, the healthcare system today, there are questions that are not right-left questions, they're right-wrong questions. You know, you, 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 and if you, if you imply the evidence of what works sensibly, you will come out with a group of solutions, you know, whatever political tradition you come from. So it's more really to say to people, look, there is a different way forward than having this, as I say, very polarised position at the moment, which in the Conservative Party is dominated by Brexit and the Labour Party haven't gone, obviously, to... Uh, pretty far left position. Globally, there's a lot of concern about the direction of politics, not just in, in Britain because of Brexit, about the rise of nationalism on the continent, and there's probably no more polarising an individual at the moment than Donald Trump. Your policy as Prime Minister was always to have a close personal relationship with American presidents. If you were Prime Minister now, what sort of relationship <laughs> would you cultivate with Mr Trump? Yeah, a close one, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, but, you know, I, I, people always want me to criticise Theresa May over this, but I think it's... It's the British Prime Minister should, should always get on well with the President of the United States if it's possible. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's got its challenges, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the fact is, you know, when, you, when you're at that senior level in politics, it's really part of your duty to your country to get on with other leaders. And, you know, one of the things that's fascinating about politics is that people always think, you know, the politics of your local community centre you know, that must be so, so different from the politics of the G8. And when you get to the G8, <laughs> if you do, you realise it's exactly the same. Both got a buffet? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more, more or less. Meat raffle and a tombow. <laughs> 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 
GA. Actually, the GA. Uh, yeah. The GA, GA might have been better for that, in fact. But, 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 no, but so, you know, you, 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 your personal chemistry and relationship is very important. So even if, you know, you're looking at a situation where you think, oh, I'm surprised at the result or surprised at the person I'm working with, you just, it's, it's part of your professional duty, I think. Because you had relationships not just with American presidents, with a variety of other world leaders. Uh, Silvio Berlusconi was someone you got to sort of know quite well. What was he like to deal with? <laughs> The, the absolute truth is that he was fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember... Uh, yeah, there was also, there's another Italian prime minister who is also a, a good guy to work with. And, you know, when we had the... So, every so often in, in Europe, you, you get the presidency of the European Union, so it rotates by countries. And this not is... anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, not for us anymore. So, anyway, 1998, we, we were the president of Europe, and this was in the first sort of flush of new labour and all the rest of it. Anyway, someone had the crazy idea, when you, you're the presidency, you do your own tie, and usually it's done by one of your very smart designers, and it's a great thing for the country, and blah, blah, blah. Right, but anyway, someone had the bright idea... Uh, somewhere in the system, that we'd actually ask a group of school kids from a school in the East End of London <laughs> to design a tie with the representation for each country that they thought of when they thought of the country. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the first I know about this, I know nothing about this decision, nothing about this, this tie. I get a call from the Italian Prime Minister. He said, hey, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 possibly. No, possibly. <laughs> This is the nation of Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Verdi, Firenze, Roma, Venezia. And here we are on your tie, Catrioni Stagi Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so, apologies for the Italian accent. <laughs> you know, I put down, I, I apologised obviously and grovelled and, and said whoever, you know, we would flog whoever did it and so on. <laughs> And then I put down the phone and a member of staff who was in the room said, Premise, you've gone white. I said, find out what the hell these kids have done with the representation <laughs> for the Germans. <laughs> Join me after the break for more with Tony Blair. I'm still here with Tony Blair. I think you've always had a sense of humour, um, as we, we've got an old school photograph here. Now, I remember this being in the newspaper, and there, there was always the accusation that you were, you were doing a rude hand signal behind the boy in front. LAUGHTER <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, So this is... Let this be a warning to any young person who wants a political career. I mean, that is one of the very few pictures of me that is obviously highly embarrassing. <laughs> Today, with social media, just be careful. <laughs> I can tell you, when I was in the band, if we'd had social media at that time, I would have certainly not been Prime Minister. <laughs> so, why, what, what would we have seen? <laughs> bad stuff. <laughs> bad, bad stuff. There have been some um, more contemporary photos of you that have uh, perhaps caused a stir. There was uh, the Christmas card the other year, which was, um, I'm sure, gratefully received by everyone who received it, but it had, um, it, was, it was mocked a little in the, in the media. Should we have a little look at... Uh, there we are. <laughs> that smile. Yeah, that's bad, isn't it? <laughs> I got so much abuse from my family out of that picture, I tell you. It was a long photo shoot and I got bored. <laughs> so, just, um, my apologies, I did apologise to my wife at the time. It looks like Cherie's saying, leave it, Tony, it's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she says that frequently. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great one of uh, you earlier in your parliamentary career. I don't know if you've seen this one before. I think this is my favourite. Oh, dear. <laughs> 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 is that, is that, I, I don't think I ever had a 
and mullet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, lo it looks like you've sort of had a mullet and, a, and, a, and perhaps a bit of a smoke or something before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think I inhaled them. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm not, I have not seen that one. Yeah, that's, that's, that's truly dreadful, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I suppose it must be... One of the pressures of being a politician in the period that you did was the new pressure of 24-hour news. Obviously, it was pre-social media, but it was, a, it was a piercing spotlight you were in. Did that ever take a, a personal toll, that sort of constant photography and, and documentation of your life? Well, you had to be very, very disciplined because, you know, certain papers would obviously go out and the one picture they, they wanted was of you either pulling a strange face, which, by the way, everyone does from time to time. I just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> um, or, you know, you, you, you would sort of fall over or something. The great thing was definitely not to fall over, but it, it's... But, you know, yeah, you, you live with that... You live with that always, but it, after a time, you get a certain kind of self-discipline in the way you handle it. And then what's it like when you see things like spit an image or sort of impressionists on TV and they've picked up on the mannerisms and things like that? I mean, is that... <laughs> is that slightly surreal to see, or...? I mean... it, is, it is a bit surreal to see, yeah. <laughs> No, actually, when one of my kids first saw you imitate me and I said, that's ridiculous, I'm nothing like that, and they said, eh. <laughs> <laughs> are. So, yeah. It's, it, it's an incredible uh, job to have done, to have led a country for, for ten years and to have won three elections. And I, I just wonder what your reflections are, because there's some huge decisions in there. Um, not just things like the minimum wage and, and foundation hospitals and, and Sure Start and all the rest of it, but things like Iraq that, that people still talk about a great deal. I just wonder if your personal reflection on, on leadership is, do the positives outweigh the negatives? Yeah, first of all, you've, just, you've got to be realistic about it, uh, which is that it's, it's an incredible privilege to be the leader of the nation. And, you know, your responsibility when you get that position is to do what you think is right and sometimes you will be right and sometimes you will be wrong, but it's important that your responsibility is to do what you think is right. And I think that, you know, when I think of all the opportunities I've had, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it has been a privilege and an honour, and you should never, ever forget that. And, and, and the, you know, the ten years I spent in Downing Street were, of course, at times extremely uh, pressured and, you know, at times you, you would feel, um, you know, in... I would say, you know, distress because the pressure was, was very great. But all the time you're aware of the fact, well, there's all sorts of people wanting to take your job and do your job. And, you know, I used to sometimes when I would go back in the, in the, um, in the flat above the Downing Street and I'd sit down at the kitchen table and I'd start, you know, moaning to Cherie that it was all a bit, you know, tough and people were coming at me and all the criticism. And she would say, shut up, stop whinging, it's voluntary. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it's true, and that's what you've got to you've you've got to realise. And you know, as I say, keep your your your, your sense of humour. Um, in fact, I remember just after I just after I left office, I was actually at a, a an airport somewhere off to do a speech, and this 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 guy comes up to me and says, "Oh my goodness," he says, "I'm your biggest fan." He said, "I absolutely love you. I love your speeches. You know, I love watching you in Parliament. You know, I've really studied you carefully. You know." I'm, this is really my greatest day to meet you. And I'm saying, oh, well, thank you very much. This is very, very kind. And I said, well, I'm afraid I've got to go to, from my plane now. And he says, yeah, thank you very much. Great to see you, Mr Brown. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, in the end, whatever's going on in the great sweep of, you know, the, the pressures and all the rest of it, you've also got to realise, you know, you're there for a time and then the new people come in and, you know, it's, 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 it's the way it is. But it was, it was a privilege even if it wasn't always a joy. It's 20 years since you became Prime Minister, it's 10 years since you um, left yeah. uh, as Prime Minister. Do you reflect on that period at all, the sort of the end of the, the party as, it, as it's called? Uh, the end of what party? <laughs> <laughs> in, in a way, the sort of the end of New Labour. Yeah, well, look, I, I, the, my view is, but you know, people are entitled to their own views, my view is that Labour wins when it, when it is at the cutting edge of the future, when it's a modernising project, because you know, today's world is defined by change and it's not to betray your principles if you apply th your principles differently in each generation. So, you know, values are timeless, but policies are for each time. And the thing that matters today is for the Labour Party 
you know, to address the concerns of people today in language they understand and in, in a context which makes sense to them. And if we go backwards, we are going to, to just repeat the mistakes of the past. And I think whether it's Attlee in 45 or Wilson in 64 or what we managed to do in 97, when you're at the cutting edge of the future, that's when you win as a progressive party. And, you know, when I came into politics, the Conservative Party for most of our 100 years of existence had been the governing party, and occasionally, you know, the Labour Party All was allowed. All of Greg's life. <laughs> <laughs> he lost his seat, actually, in, in 97, didn't you, Greg, when we won in 97? Yeah, so, I'm uh, very grateful to you. You were one of the first supporters of the band. You, you helped promote our first uh, <laughs> record. I did, didn't uh, I? But I'm less it. grateful to you, for you were the main reason I lost my seat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> late for an apology, but uh, yeah, no. So, so you know, we used to we used to we lose the whole time, and then every so often, when the Tories wanted a breather, you know, we would be allowed into government, and we'd govern for a time and go back out again. And I wanted to change all that. Uh, the New Labour years were, were known for a lot of things. Uh, culturally, was this sort of this idea of command and control and pages, and obviously, you need as a prime minister strong whips, and in our band. Two of your henchmen were, were uh, Ian Causey and Kevin Brennan. I think we have a photo, an old whips photo, of the three of you together. There we oh. are. There's Tony in the middle. And can you spot Ian and Kevin on the yeah. back row? Oh. <laughs> and there's yeah. handsome boys yeah. on the back row. Yeah. But fortunately, they're not as nice as they look. <laughs> <laughs> they were very good whips. They knew how to apply the pressure. And how would they do that? We never told him. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, used to, I used to say, I used to say to him, well, "Why are you going to persuade them to change their mind?" He said, "You don't want to know that." Just, <laughs> <laughs> you get on with you know, running down East Street. I I, uh, I I came into a meeting once where Ian was there as well. When with Tony, what was it? What bill was it about? It was Ian? the ninety-day detention. The ninety-day detention stuff, and we were desperately trying to persuade our colleagues to vote for it. And I was late for the meeting and. You weren't supposed to be late for any meetings with Tony, so uh, I came in. I said, "I'm sorry, I'm late, Prime Minister. I've just been uh, just been persuading uh, an errant colleague to vote with us." And then Ian called out, uh, "Was it him? Gordon?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my> <laughs> and was it? <laughs> Tony, it's a question we had earlier in the show. Which MP does or did annoy you? It doesn't have to be a backbencher. I don't know who got under my skin, but the person who was... The person who disrupted me most when I was doing Prime Minister's Questions mm. used to be Dennis Skinner. Because he was brilliant yeah. if he was on side. <laughs> <laughs> but he, and he, he was fantastic. So all the time when you were at the dispatch box, so you were answering questions from everybody. And one of the things you never quite see when you're watching Prime Minister's questions is th that people are shouting things at you the whole time, but it's not often picked up. So, for example, you'd be standing at the dispatch box and people would be saying... God, he looks ill today. Is that <laughs> or, you know, one time someone said, does he know his fly's done? <laughs> <laughs> and you're answering the questions, trying to think, can I, do I dare... <laughs> <laughs> or not? Um, but Dennis was the guy. He, I didn't exactly get under my skin, but you had to be aware of him the entire time. If you were, if you were addressing the House of Commons, he was giving a running commentary the entire time, and you better hope that it was good, because if it wasn't, he was on your case. So I reckon i give the sort of parliamentarian of my time, irritating or not, um, to Dennis, I think. That's a very good answer. A good politician's answer, yeah. <laughs> so, Tony. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's Thank you so much for coming on. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Blair. Well, that's all we've got time for, not just for this week, but for this series. Thanks once again to Tony Blair and to all of you for watching. Now, here to play us out, it's the Grandmasters of Whip Hop, MP4. <laughs>
Yeah.